God bless us. So please uh, welcome Dick, Dick Seams. Thank you very much. Um, holy cow, that sounded pretty good. I like that. reminding me he did that. <laughs> you know, I, my name is Dick Seams. Actually, it's Richard, but everybody that knows me calls me Dick. Um, and I am a prideaholic. Um, I, I can get really pumped up when I think about what I've done, and then the Lord reminds me, you really didn't do any of that. That's exactly right. Well, I did the bad stuff. He didn't do that. <laughs> but anything good that's happened through me has been done by the Lord. So I really appreciate that last song. I appreciate them all. But the last, when Holy Spirit come and uh, fill us as the temple again. What I want to talk with you and think you, with you about this morning for a few minutes is being under the influence. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I said being <laughs> under the influence. Uh, where on earth is he going with that? Well, I don't really know for sure. I have a preconceived notion, but actually, uh, let's just pause and pray, and let's ask that the Lord would kick me out of the way, and he would speak to all of us. Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for every man that's here, for everyone that's come to worship you, and to think about how you would use each of us I do ask that the Holy Spirit would come and just fill each of us as the modern day temple. Uh, would you just kick me out of the way if I get in the way and just have your Holy Spirit to work in us as only you can and you desire. For I pray it in Jesus' name. When, when I say being under the influence, what do you think? Anybody? I'm, I'm going to ask you. Alcohol, drugs. Al alcohol, <coughs> drugs. Anybody else? Holy Spirit. Thank you. What else? Being under the influence. What are the real results of being under the influence other than the Holy Spirit at this point? Being directed a certain way. Be directed a certain way. Pardon? Consequences. Consequences. Lack of control. Lack of control. Happiness. Slave. I didn't hear. Unhappiness. Unhappiness. I want to show you a short video. Uh, some of you that are close to my age are going to recognize this probably. Some of you who are younger are wonder, going to wonder, who on earth is that? Let me cue this up. It's just a few minutes, but it, it's kind of a humorous... Okay, we, many of us can laugh at that, and I realize my sense of humor is unusual. Uh, Maybe my humor doesn't have sense, but, but I, I like that particular routine, and it reminds me of how silly we can be when we're under the influence of unusual things. So once again, um, I ask you, what's it like to be under the influence? What, what was it like to be under the influence for Foster Brooks? Delusional. Delusional. What else? Scattered. Not in control. Not in, not in control. He wasn't clear thinking. He wasn't clear thinking. That's right. Theologic. You know, I looked up uh, on the internet what Mayo Clinic says are the results of being <coughs> under the influence. And here's what they said. It said it's being overcome or overtaken. Well, he was certainly overcome or overtaken. It's to be not self-conscious. Obviously, he couldn't have been very self-conscious, or he wouldn't have been acting that way. To have little self-control. To have a high pain tolerance. And if you've ever been under that kind of influence, you know that you can injure yourself and don't even know it until the next day. To have an insatiable, insatiable appetite for whatever you're uh, being influenced by. And to center your days around getting more. We, 
named a few things before that we can be under the influence of in our society. Let's name some more. We know <coughs> drugs and alcohol. Let's let's leave the Holy Spirit for later. What else? Pornography. Pardon? Pornography. Pornography. Money. 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 I didn't hear one over here. Music. Music. Pride. Food. Pride. Pride. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Adrenaline. All, are any of those really good? <coughs> Probably not, at least used to that extent. Is there anything that it would be good to be under the influence of? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay, I have some scriptures that I would like to have somebody read. Do I have any volunteers that either have a Bible or something? They can do it on their phone. Greg, would you look up Ephesians 5, 18 through 21? Who else? Who else? 1 Samuel 16, 13. Who else? 2 Samuel 7, 1 and 2. And Romans 12, 1 and 2. Two more. How about if I hand it to you? Can I get Ephesians 5:21? Uh, Ephesians 5:18 through 21. So would you do Galatians 2:20 and Proverbs 3:5 through 6? Now we're not going to do all those right now. We'll hold them for just a minute, uh, but be ready because at some point I want you to read those. So the first one I'd like to have read is Ephesians 5, 18 only. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled by the Spirit. Read that again, please. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled by the Spirit. So there is something good to be under the influence of. So how do you imagine we would act if we were under the influence of the Holy Spirit? like we act in a negative way when we're under the influence of the bad things. For instance, would we be overcome and overtaken? Yeah. Would we be less self-conscious or not self-conscious? Yeah. Would we have less self-control but more spirit control? Yeah. Would we have a higher pain tolerance? Yeah. I would not worry as much about what's happening to me if I were really controlled by the Spirit. Would we have an insatiable appetite for the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yeah. Would we spend our days trying to obtain more of the Holy Spirit? I think so. Now, let me pause here to say that we may have differing opinions of what it means to be controlled by the Holy Spirit or to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And that's okay. We don't have to agree on everything. But at this point, let's just focus on being controlled and not exactly how it manifests itself in us other than those things we've just talked about. Can you think of an individual in Scripture that you believe was really controlled by the Holy Spirit? Daniel. Daniel. Saul. Peter. Saul. <coughs> Peter. Jesus Christ. Jesus. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Jesus, I guess, is the classic. He's the perfect example. Who else? Paul. Paul. David. 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 Who else? John, Noah, Noah. Moses, Moses. there were a lot, Abraham, 
Abraham, Elijah, Elijah, Elisha. There are a lot of them. But the one that I want to focus on is David. You say, now, wait a minute. I thought the Holy Spirit didn't come until the New Testament. Jesus said, unless I leave, the Comforter won't come. So I want somebody to, whoever I gave, 1 Samuel 16, 13. Right here. Would you read that? This is the uh, English Standard Version. Then Samuel <coughs> took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David. David. So... Whether or not we believe that the Holy Spirit was active in the Old Testament, here's an evidence that he was, and Scripture clearly says that. So what do we know about David? Well, we know that David was the eighth son. He had seven older brothers. He was a son of Jesse, who was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He uh, was a shepherd boy at the point that he was the youngest. He was a tender of sheep. We know that God selected him through Samuel to become the second king of Israel. We know that Samuel described David as a man after God's own heart. I'm not aware that anybody else in scripture is defined or described that way, a man after God's own heart. Um, we know that David became Saul's right-hand man. In fact, Saul discovered through Samuel that David could play music that would soothe Saul when the evil spirit or whatever it was came upon Saul. And so Saul recognized that he was a good warrior, that uh, he was a, 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 an eloquent speaker, and that he was a good friend. And he actually became the best friend of Saul's son, Jonathan. He became Saul's armor bearer and uh, confidant and uh, attendant. And we know that David was never defeated in battle. <coughs> There's no, all the battles that David were, was involved in are recorded in First and Second Samuel. And there's no record of David ever being defeated. Now the truth is, David was just an instrument. It's God who was never defeated, but he used David to lead the, the uh, warriors that uh, conquered the enemies of Israel. Is there a particular instance that reminds you of how spirit controlled, how under the influence of the Holy Spirit, David was? Before you answer, I'm going to draw you to Goliath, the event with Goliath. And I think that's kind of my stereotypical example of being under the control of the Spirit. What do we know about Goliath? Goliath was a Philistine. Goliath scripture says, if you, if you translate uh, the metrics in scripture, most people say that Goliath was six feet nine. I'm sorry, nine foot six. I got those numbers reversed. Nine foot six. How high do you think the ceiling is? <coughs> Yeah, so I, I would say a little over 10, or about 10. So his head was approximately up to the ceiling. It says his armor weighed 125 pounds. Who in here weighs close to 125 pounds? It would be like carrying Jared around on my back. That would be uh, Goliath's armor. It says his spear had a... Uh, the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. I don't know how big that is, but it's obviously big. <laughs> and the head of the spear weighed 17 pounds, if you uh, translate the metrics. Can you imagine, that's about the size of a turkey. Maybe not a huge turkey, but at Thanksgiving, if you take a typical family turkey, it's probably 12 to 20 pounds. So take a frozen turkey, put it on the end of a tube of floor, and carry that around as a weapon with the turkey at the end. This was a big, strong man. He must have weighed like 400 pounds and was not obese, I suppose. This is Goliath, and he taunted Israel. In fact, Scripture says that for 40 days and 40 nights, he would come up to the line, whatever the battle line was, 
and he would taunt Israel, including Saul and all his mighty warriors. And he would say, uh, choose you a champion and send him to me and we'll do battle. Now, apparently at that time in history, that was, uh, that was typically how they would fight. Now, I don't know of a single record where that ever settled anything. So I suppose that if they had done that, whichever one had won, everybody else would have fought anyway, I'm imagining. I'm taking liberty with scripture. But he says, choose a champion and send him, <clears throat> send him forward. Now, Saul was a big man. Saul was a strong man, and he was the current king. And yet he cowered, and all of the Israelites cowered with him at the sight of Goliath for 40 days and 40 nights. How does David get involved? David was sent by Jesse to take some food to his brothers. Three of David, David's three oldest brothers were warriors with Saul. They were a party to the group that cowered at Goliath. So Jesse said, do your chores in the morning, then take this food to your brothers and greet them and see how the battle is going. So he did, and he shows up. Most theologians believe that David was about five foot three. I don't know how they determined that. They believe that he was about 14 years of, old, uh, years of age. He was probably about 120 pounds, most likely, the weight of Saul's armor. So David shows up and he says, what's going on here? And asks, why are you cowering to this uh, Philistine? And they explain to him and uh, David asks, well, what if somebody challenges him? And they really make fun of him, particularly his brothers made fun of him and said, who do you think you are wanting to go up against somebody that's not only that big, but the, but that well trained in battle, and you're not, you're a sheep herder, why don't you just go on home and leave us alone? You know what struck David? Scripture says that what really struck David is that Goliath was taunting the army of the living God, of the living <coughs> God. David was willing to challenge Goliath, and he made that known. Not on his own power, and he knew that. And so everybody, including his brothers, said, well, you're foolish, but if you're going up against Goliath, you need weapons, you need armor. So they tried to put Saul's armor on him. Like I said, Saul's believed to have been a big man. It didn't work well for him. He couldn't move well. They gave him his spear, or his sword, I'm sorry, his sword, and it was too heavy for him to carry. He said, I can't go into battle like this. I need to use what I typically use, and that was a slingshot, which apparently was more of just a sling, not like our typical rubberized slingshots today. So he chose his sling and five small round stones, Scripture says. And he went up, up against Goliath, not just with those, but filled with the spirit of the living God. And he said, Goliath... I'm going to kill you in the name of the Most High God, and I'm going to cut off your head so that all the earth will know that there is a God in Israel. That was his purpose, not to demonstrate how great he was, to demonstrate how great God was. And that's what happened. So he defeated not only Goliath, he defeated the Philistines, because after the rest of the Philistines saw Goliath killed, and his head cut off, they fled, and that battle was over. Now, can you think of somebody in Scripture that <coughs> demonstrates being under the influence of something other than the Holy Spirit? Saul? Samson. Samson? Yeah. Well, David was under when he, when he went after Bathsheba. This is, this Whoa! You know, he was not under the Spirit of God. <coughs> Thank you, yes. So that's the one I'd like to think about. I'd like to think about David and Bathsheba. Now, by the way, the story of David and Goliath is in 1 Samuel, mostly in like the 13th uh, through 16th chapters. 2 Samuel is sequential to it, or subsequent from it. 
And the story of David and Bathsheba is in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 uh, and 12. So the story of David and Bathsheba is, Scripture says that it became spring, and that's a time when kings went out to battle. And it says David didn't go out to battle. So I can only assume that that was disobedience on his part. And it further says that in the evening he was on the roof, whatever that means, of uh, the palace, and he saw Bathsheba bathing. And he recognized that she was very beautiful. <laughs> and so he inquired about her and asked for her to be brought to the palace. Now he probably already knew that Bathsheba was married to Uriah. And he probably already knew that Uriah was off doing battle with the general that David had sent. Scripture says David didn't go. It was typical for him to go, but he didn't. So he, uh, Uriah, uh, Bathsheba's husband, was doing battle with the warriors under uh, Joab. So David saw Bathsheba, desired her, called her to the palace, and had sexual intercourse to it with her. Now, I'm going to say, I'm not going to say slept with her. You know, I sleep with my wife every night. We don't have sex every night. <laughs> so I think sleeping with is, it's the politically correct way to say having sexual intercourse with. But that's what David did. And so time passes a little bit in scripture, and pretty soon she sends a note to, a message to David that she's pregnant. Uh-oh. Now he can get caught in his sin. So what does he do? He tries to cover it up. So he's already guilty of adultery. He's guilty of lust. He's guilty of adultery. He's guilty of not going out to battle when he's supposed to, it appears from Scripture. So he calls for Uriah. He sends a note to Joab, and he says, Send Uriah home so that he can tell me what's going on in battle. So Joab sends Uriah home. Uriah shows up, tells David what's going on in battle, doesn't realize David's plan. And David says, uh, so just stay here for a night and go home and be with your family. Appreciate so much what you're doing with the rest of the warriors. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept just outside the palace with the other guards, or with the guards. And so David finds that out, and he calls him in the next morning, and he says, uh, why didn't you go home? I told you to go home and, and enjoy. I am so appreciative of what you're doing. And Uriah says, no, I couldn't. I couldn't knowing that all of my fellow warriors were not eating home-cooked food, were not living with their wife, were not going to bed with their wife, I just couldn't do that. So David says, I tell you what, why don't you come over for dinner tonight? This is in my words, obviously. So Uriah comes over for dinner, and Dave wines and dines him and gets him drunk. And the scripture very clearly says David made him drunk. Right. Mm -hmm. Then he says, why don't you go home tonight? Again, Uriah doesn't go home. So he doesn't sleep with his wife, and so now they can't, they can't imagine that this illegitimate baby was actually legitimate between Bathsheba and Uriah. So now what's David going to do? There's a witness to the crime. There's one person other than David and Bathsheba that knows that this is not Uriah's uh, child. So Uriah goes back to battle. David sends a message to Joab saying, Put Uriah where the battle is the fiercest, and then have everyone else draw back, leaving him exposed so that he'll be killed. So now David conspires to commit murder. Yes, it was a battle. Yes, it was war, but they conspired to make sure that Uriah died. Uriah did die, and everybody that withdrew also, or a lot of the, the warriors that drew back from him were also killed. So now the witness to the crime, other than the two of them, is gone. Now David marries Bathsheba, and she becomes his wife. So it appears that this, the secret is secure. 
Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause this story. All I wanted to do is to demonstrate that the same individual was very much under the influence of the Holy Spirit, and then at another time and later in life, very much under the influence of something else. By the way, what do you think he was under the influence of? Lust. Lust. Sin. 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 Pride. The devil. The devil. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Scripture doesn't say exactly, but I think all those things are correct answers. Now, I don't know about you, but this makes me really wonder why. Wait a minute. I, I see David as my premier example of being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I also see David being my premier example of being under the influence of something else, something bad. I would say depression. He was under oppression because I understand that a Christian can be oppressed by the devil but not be possessed by the devil over the years. I've learned that. You, you may be right, but let's, let's look through Scripture and see if there are any uh, examples of this if there's any information. So I spent some time reading between the 16th chapter, the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel and the 11th and 12th chapter of uh, 2 Samuel. What happened? Why do I need to know? I, w I don't want it to happen to me. Now, I'm not trying to present myself as an example of being under the, the influence of the Holy Spirit, but I certainly want to be. And here's what I found. I found out that David uh, lost his focus. So somebody in here, I assigned 2 Samuel 7, verse 1. Who, has, who did I assign that to? Just chapter 7, verse 1 for now. So read 7, 1 again, please. Now it came to pass, when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around. Okay, the Lord gave him rest from all of his enemies. So this actually isn't something David did. It's something the Lord did. But then let's see what happened. Read 7, 2 now. That the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. So that's two. Read that again, please. That the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Okay, so what has happened? David. He has gone from being the warrior king to imagining that the enemies are not very active right now, so I can change my focus. And my focus is to do something really good. Now, wasn't it a good thing to realize that his palace was better than where God, God dwelt? Well, yeah. Wasn't it a good thing that David wanted to build the temple? Well, yeah. But was it what God wanted? No, it's not what God wanted. In fact, God said, no, you're not going to build the temple because you're my warrior king. In fact, your son is going to build my temple. And that's what happened. So David changed focus. Now, what should he have done? I don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. But I'm going to imagine that David should have spent that time just solidifying mm -hmm his relationship with God, and being prepared for more battle. Because the battles weren't over. There are battles after that. Uh, some that da David led and some that his sons or other people led. So David lost his focus. He lost his dependency upon the Holy Spirit. Yes, he wanted to do a good thing. In fact, he wanted to do a really good thing. He wanted to build the temple for the Most High God. So what's my point? <coughs> my
my point is, once we're we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, we need to make sure we stay there. How do we get and stay under the influence of the Holy Spirit? Uh, one of these I want to have read again. Whoever had Ephesians 5, 18 through 21? Coming up. <clears throat> so the rest of you be ready. Most of these we're going to read. All right. Ephesians 5, this time 18 through 21. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music from your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Wow. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Uh, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So in Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, it talks about being filled and how that will work out through you. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it talks about submitting and being transformed. And it doesn't say transform yourself. It says be transformed. So to, to die to ourself. We die to ourself and we have to stay dead to ourselves. Possibly David stopped being dead to himself. Who has Proverbs 3, 5 through 10? I don't have my reading glasses, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. 5 and 6. 5 through 10. If you need it, it's, I think, the bottom one. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And always acknowledge him. He will make your paths straight. These are not the only scriptures that tell us how to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But these are certainly pretty dramatic ones. And so I invite you, along with me, to submit to these scriptures. To attempt to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I want to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. I want people to not see me. When I look at me, I don't even like the way I look that much. But I like the way Jesus looks. I like the way the Holy Spirit acts. So let's attempt to not get drunk with wine or ego or lust or pornography or all those other things we mentioned a lot that we didn't mention but be filled with the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that you called us to be in your family. And then you just didn't leave us alone to struggle, but rather that you sent the Holy Spirit to seal us, to perfect us, to make us what you want us to be. And you gave your word, the written record of Jesus, Thank you for Jesus, everything about him. Thank you that he indwells us through the Holy Spirit. Thank you that we are going to be there when he comes again, whether dead or alive at the time. We will rise and we will reign with him. Father, I look forward so much to that time. Not a death wish, but I cannot wait to see you as you really are. To see Jesus as he is to see God the Father as you are, to be totally consumed by the Holy Spirit. Father, just have your way in us, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.